This is the second and final lesson and lecture on the book of Colossians, and I'd like to begin by reading from an unlikely passage of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3, to introduce our section today. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And then in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. The reason I read that was because in the book of Colossians we have the activities of the serpent again. And we we have looked at the outline of the book of Colossians. We said that it had, we suggested, a threefold outline. Uh, Roman numeral one, the deity and preeminence of the Savior. And then the second point that we're going to look at uh, today the danger and perversion of the serpent. And so the serpent is still busy in Ball's day, and of course he's busy today in our day. And in this section here we list seven ways that the serpent was at work in the time of Paul when he wrote Colossians, attempting to undermine the word of God in the Church of Colossae, just as he once did in the Garden of Eden. And, uh, you know, the, the devil has changed very little. The devil, in some ways, is like Jesus. Now, please hear me out on that. Jesus never changes, and what Jesus used to do, he does today. And in a sense, uh, in a relative sense of the word, Satan also is immutable. He never changes. Uh, the tactics and the uh, maneuvering that he once found to be successful thousands of years even before the flood, uh, he uses today because they are just uh, as successful today. And I suppose one of the reasons is he doesn't need to change because fallen human nature has not changed. And only Jesus Christ can change a sinner by giving him a new nature if he repents. But Satan began by doubting the word of God, hath God said, and then by denying it, ye shall not surely die. And here we see him now doing both these things, confusing uh, the word of God and the minds and hearts of the uh, believers in in the city of Colossae. And these seven areas now we'll study He does, first of all, by enticing words, as he did to Eve. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good uh, from evil. Notice Colossians 2 and verse 4. Paul says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. We're not sure what those enticing words were. We do know that the Gnostics... Uh, had the philosophy, of course, that, that uh, this world didn't count anyway and that you could do anything you wanted. And uh, there are all kinds of enticing words today, uh, the words of the liberals uh, that would say this world is getting better and better. And there are still some fuzzy-minded liberals that are saying that in spite of two bloody world wars. Uh, They would say, by way of enticing sentences and words, that salvation can still be obtained through education or legislation or through evolution. Enticing words. Now, the Bible says that in the latter days, perilous times shall come. So the Christian is the ultimate optimist because he knows that someday the story is going to have a happy ending. The bridegroom gets the bride and they ride off in the sunset and get married and live happily ever after. So he certainly is not a pessimist, but he's also a realist. He knows that uh, the world cannot be saved apart from uh, the battle of Armageddon, the great tribulation, and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, beware lest any man should beguile you, should, should hoodwink you, 
uh, should con you, should trick or deceive you uh, by these enticing words. And then he warns the church about philosophy. If ever a word was ill-named, it is the word philosophy, human philosophy. It comes from two Greek words, sophos is knowledge or wisdom, and philos is love. And so you put them together, philosophy is literally the love of wisdom or the love of knowledge. And uh, the human philosopher has no love for real wisdom at all, because the Bible says that the beginning, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. My senior year in college, I uh, took a course in philosophy, I had several courses, but this was, uh, I guess it was my junior year, I took another course, senior introductory course, and uh, I believe the philosopher's name was, uh, that we studied was Peter Batoki, and uh, he has... Um, I don't know whether he's still living or not, but he was one of the leading philosophers of the day in the, in the 50s when I went to college. And, and uh, I remember the textbook was around uh, nearly 500 pages. Uh, it, uh, the name of it was An Introduction to Philosophy. And of the 500 pages, Jesus Christ was not found on any of those pages. Not once, not even as a, as a possible candidate for some good uh, words of wisdom. And God was found only about a half a dozen times, and then it was used, the name, in a metaphysical physical sense of the word. And I think it was page 300 or 325 before the name God even appeared, you see. Uh, well, at any rate, he warns them about vain philosophy. In chapter 2, of verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That word spoil has reference to uh, ruination of a good product. For example, the, it refers to uh, uh, the uh, uh, souring of wine, and uh, that of milk, and of bread turning moldy, and of meat turning into a rotten state. And and what he's saying here is that God has created in you the, the good bread of salvation and, and your desire, the meat of the word and the, and the milk and, and the wine of the spirit. And don't let modern or ancient, uh, eastern or western uh, philosophies and philosophical systems uh, spoil you, cause you to go moldy or, or sour or rank or rotten. Beware of... A philosophy. I have in one of our textbooks that we uh, wrote and that you had to read at the beginning of the semester, your first semester, entitled That Manuscript from Outer Space. And I didn't read these statements or call your attention to them, but at the back of the book, The Manuscript from Outer Space, you may want to check this out later, it makes uh, a very interesting reading some of the statements of the philosophers of the world uh, on their, if not deathbed, at least in the last part of their life. Now, uh, I'm quoting from these men that uh, were not drunkards. Uh, these were not uh, men on death row. Uh, these were philosophers, men that uh, had accepted or that had uh, received the acclaim of the world. Many of them were uh, recognized authorities in their own fields and and they had popularity and power and and most of them enjoyed good health and so they we could not say these are bitter men and uh, just they went through some terrible experiences and this is the reason they were so pessimistic but these are men that had the best that life had to offer and what is their uh, what is their uh, uh, advice uh, to the world before they died uh, well, uh, Lord Byron uh, said these words, Count o'er the joys thine hours have seen. Count o'er the days from anguish free. And know whatever thou hast been, tis something better not to be. Oh, those are chilling words. You know what uh, Lord Byron, the English poet, was saying here? Well, he said, uh, you uh, make a list and you count uh, those hours 
that you've just enjoyed yourself and list the days that you haven't had a care in the world and know that even though uh, those uh, good hours far outweigh the bad hours and those good days would outnumber the bad days uh, by ten to one, he said, no, whatever thou hast been, tis something better not to be. I read somewhere, Ben Benner, if you'd never been born, uh, that uh, one, the philosophy of life, uh, a philosopher was this, that, that uh, the, uh, uh, the worst thing on earth uh, was to be born and now living. Uh, the second uh, worst thing, a little something better than to be born and now living, is to be dead. But the best thing is never to have been born. Now that's what actually what Lord Byron is saying here. And then here is a man, a European philosopher, who won the Nobel Prize some time ago. His name was Anatole France, and he writes these words. He said, In all the world the unhappiest creature is man. He takes my hands in his, and his are trembling and feverish. He looks me in the eyes, his are full of tears, his face is haggard. He sighs. There is not in all the universe a creature more unhappy than I. People think me happy. I have never been happy for one day, not for a single hour. And only of recent time, the last five or six years, uh, the leading philosopher in, uh, in Europe died, uh, Bertrand Russell. And uh, he spent some years teaching here in America before he went back to London and and here is what he said. He was an agnostic, and he said, The life of man is a long march toward the night, through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain, towards a goal that few can hope to reach, and where none may tarry long. And then here is a man we all know, and the scientists of the world today practically worship Charles Darwin. And Darwin said this, one of the last things that he wrote in his diary. He said, I have everything to make me happy and contented, but life has become very wearisome to me. Do you know if we would take the advice of the philosophers, uh, we would uh, all get razor blades and guns or whatever and slit our wrists or blow our brains out right now and end the misery that we're all going to experience later on anyway. So uh, Paul warns them about listening to the philosophy of this world. And then the third uh, perversion that he warns the Colossian believers is that of tradition. He says that you beware of falling into the traditions of men and not after Christ. Chapter 2, verse 8. All traditions, of course, are not bad. There are some very beautiful, uh, patriotic, uh, historical traditions and religious and biblical, uh, or at least uh, church history-centered traditions that, that are very wonderful. Uh, my wife uh, first learned about a, a, a tradition, and she thought it was a beautiful thing, and she sort of held me to it. We went into the ministry, and that was it, that uh, this tradition, that uh, any time a pastor uh, had a funeral or a wedding, uh, that uh, any money that he received and all monies that he received uh, for these services uh, should go to the pastor's wife. And my wife thought that was a very beautiful tradition. So there are good traditions, but... Um, many traditions are evil, and our Roman Catholic friends, you ask them uh, to prove some of their dogmas uh, from the Word of God, and they would uh, acknowledge freely and honestly that uh, these cannot be proved, for example, the worship of Mary and the confession of uh, sins to a priest or even the papal infallibility. Uh, most recent dogma, the bodily assumption of Mary, that she died, or actually she departed this earth without seeing death, they would say, and purgatory and the rest. Well, admittedly, we, uh, we do not turn to the Bible to find these, but you see, uh, we feel that dogma can come either from the Pope or from the Bible, 
or from the tradition of the fathers. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether they can go back to the 3rd century A.D. and say, well, now look, by this time, 17 centuries ago, uh, the worship of Mary was gaining a foothold. Well, I'm sure that's the case, but that didn't mean it's good. Uh, about that time, I think, uh, the epidemic of smallpox began to hit certain areas in Europe, and then it had its climax a thousand years later in the Middle Ages. But I don't think anybody would say that smallpox is good because it's been around longer than maybe the modern heart attack uh, problem has been around. Uh, if the thing is old, uh, if it's wrong, it doesn't matter how old it is or how new it is. Uh, it's, if it's wrong, it's, it's wrong. So he warns about the traditions of men. And then legalism. You know, uh, I wrote a definition of legalism some time ago. I've never heard this definition spelled out before, and maybe it's not a good one, but I think it is. What is legalism? Of course, a general definition is, is putting oneself back under the law. Uh, but uh, you know what legalism is? Legalism is an attempt to mend the ripped veil in the temple. I'll go back and repeat that. It's an attempt to rend, I'm sorry, to mend, rather, the ripped veil in the temple. One of the first things that happened, a lot of amazing uh, traumatic things took place when Jesus cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished. And one of the things, first things that happened, though, the temple was rent in two, the veil, separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And this was God's way, of course, and it ripped from the top down to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom. And it was God that did this. And uh, this was God's way of saying that up till that time, only the high priest had access to the very presence of God, and he could only come in once a year during Yom Kippur, and the high priest would be the only one that could do that. And uh, from this point on, though, the humblest believer, uh, the Skid Row bum, who got saved at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, even before he lost his whiskey hangover, even while he still had the smell of alcohol in his breath, uh, could walk into that area that only the high priest could walk into and then even then enjoy far more than the high priest could uh, access and fellowship with God himself. So legalism is any attempt uh, to uh, put the believer back under the law and to mend that ripped veil in the temple. And the priest had to do that, by the way. They had a problem there. I don't imagine they just uh, took that down and ran out to Kmart and bought another one. They couldn't do that. Uh, that thing cost uh, somewhere, I read, over $10,000, and it may have weighed three or 400 pounds. I mean, this was a thick, heavy, uh, purple, Babylonian, uh, uh, specially customized, uh, whatever you want to say, veil. And it was an extremely valuable thing, a heavy thing, a thick thing, an expensive thing. And uh, doubtless uh, took another year to make another one if they even made another one. The temple was destroyed, of course, 30, 40 years later. They may have, but at any rate, they had to mend that. There was no way they could allow it to, to remain ripped that way. And, and they probably had all kinds of arguments and, uh, on uh, why it was ripped and who ripped it and and, but they kept it pretty quiet. You never read about it uh, being let out. But uh, that's what legalism basically, I think, is an attempt to mend the ripped veil in the temple. Paul warns about that. He said in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, this does not mean that the believer is not to be concerned about anything that he does. Uh, it does mean here, though, I mean, those things that are immoral. Obviously, Paul is not saying, now, look, if you want to go out and commit adultery, don't you let anybody tell you you shouldn't do that. Or if you want to go out and get drunk, it says here, let no man judge you and drink. No, it doesn't mean that at all, obviously, because those things are forbidden. But it does mean... Uh, that uh, the child of God, uh, it's really, a, he's warning again against, uh, as we're talking about legalism here, uh, that the child of God is not to put himself back under the law and, and uh, say, well, uh, you know, I can only walk uh, so many feet on the Sabbath and, and uh, I'm to uh, do certain things on the Sabbath. I can't carry any 
uh, burden uh, upon me and I can't light a fire and I can't gather stones on the, or sticks on the Sabbath and I have to make sure that all these feast days and fast days in the Old Testament are carefully observed and I, I must make sure that, that my children are circumcised properly and, and uh, no, he said don't let, he didn't say never do it, but he said don't let any man judge you and uh, that's what legalism all right, he speaks of enticing words, of philosophy, of traditions, of legalism. Then he warns about mysticism. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 2, Let no man beguile you, he used that word beguile a number of times, uh, of your reward in a voluntary humility, a false uh, humility, in verse 18. Um, this uh, mysticism, I think, uh, may be seen in neo-orthodoxy today or maybe in the Quaker movement, sort of that inner light uh, thing. And, and as we have here, uh, mysticism stresses that inner light and ignores the true light. It confuses truth with personal experience. I think sometimes our charismatic friends are guilty of mysticism. They have a religion of emotion and and uh, you can show them the Word of God, and, well, they feel uh, certain things. And uh, your feelings now may be right or they may be wrong. Uh, they are to be judged by the Word of God, and the Word of God is not to be judged by your feelings or by your experiences. Mysticism. All right, and then idolatry. Of course... Uh, uh, idolatry here in reference to the worshiping of angels in chapter 2 and uh, verse 18. In your notes it says verse 8, but it should be verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Uh, by the way, that word reward there I think uh, does indicate uh, that this, uh, uh, these perversions can keep a believer from receiving those rewards at the judgment seat of Christ that he otherwise would have received and that God wanted him to receive. Uh, it speaks of the worshiping of angels. Now again, our Roman Catholic friends are guilty of this, not so much as they used to be, but uh, often the, the church, uh, many of the uh, European uh, Catholic churches have far more uh, angels attending, uh, statues that is, of their services than human beings. Now, uh, God made man a little lower than the angels. Uh, that is to say, he allowed sin to come into the world and, and a man now uh, is not as strong and he's not as uh, swift and he's not as smart as an angel, uh, but God thinks more of man than he does of angels. And it was not an angel that died upon the cross. If angels could save men, they do minister to men. If angels could save men, uh, surely Gabriel or Michael would have been willing to come down and die for the sins of the world. But they could not do that. And Jesus took upon himself the body, not of an angel, the Bible says, but the body of a man. And uh, so uh, if an angel could not save a man. How sinful, how wicked it is when a man then attempts to worship another creature, an angel. We are to worship the Creator and not the creature. In the book of Revelation, an angel was showing John the Apostle around, and John fell at his feet. John should have known better, but he was so overwhelmed with the splendor of the angel that he attempted to worship him, and the angel was horrified. And he, uh, he lifted him up and he said, don't worship me. He said, worship God. <clears throat> in fact, two times in the last few chapters in Revelation, that angel had to say that uh, to John the Apostle. And then the final thing that he warns people about here, the city of Colossae, the church of Colossae, is asceticism. And uh, these verses, uh, wherefore, <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, uh, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? This is an extreme type of separation. Asceticism is the uh, philosophy that believes that if you torment the body and 
turn your back upon the materialistic world, that you can sort of purge the, uh, the body, that the spirit uh, might uh, come forth like gold. And that's certainly not true. Uh, the monks in the Old Testament, I mean in the Middle Ages, and, and the monks that are, that are uh, in the various mountains of Switzerland today, uh, uh, taking care of their crops and maintaining the vow of silence and, and poverty and, and uh, eating grapes all their life, uh, they may uh, be harmless uh, to the world of mankind. Certainly uh, they are. They don't go out and kill anybody. They're not like the mafia, but they're not very helpful. I mean, uh, I appreciate when people pray for me, but uh, these men uh, don't know anything about me. I would much rather someone uh, really care for me to, to come where I am and to take my hand as a fallen sinner and, and tell me uh, how I can receive help from God. That's what humanity needs and not someone uh, who never has seen me and is tempting to really to work out his own problems by running from them in the mountains somewhere. So he warns against this asceticism and actually this came into uh, the church history uh, period around the third and fourth century and it plagued the church and you had uh, Simon uh, the uh, uh, the uh, stylite I think he was called because uh, he built a house on uh, stilts and and he stayed up there for years and years and years and wouldn't come down. And, and you had some of these other uh, ascetics, uh, mystics, uh, that just uh, sort of got away from everybody and, and they developed a name for themselves, but they never really helped anybody. Um, I remember Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer uh, telling this story often. He said, uh, how would you uh, young men that are graduating from the seminary how would you like to go out and pastor uh, a city in America of over 50,000 people and uh, all of them are ascetics? That is to say, uh, none of them, not one drink, not one individual smokes. There's no crime. Uh, they don't drink. They don't pick their nose. They don't watch raunchy TV movies. Uh, any sin you want to mention, they don't do. Well, some of our fellows, hey, that'd be great. Uh, you know, boy, we could really... Uh, put our uh, separatist uh, convictions into practice and then he gave the name of the city and not too many wanted to take it is New York County Cemetery you see well none of them did anything uh, of course they're dead so asceticism is uh, only part of the story it is a separation from the world but that doesn't mean anything uh, the second part of this is a separation to the Lord now when you separate from that's fine but you only separate from that you might separate to. And I'm not sure the Christian need to be that much concerned. Uh, I uh, got saved, and, and uh, a few when God really got on a hold of my heart, I, I really didn't give up smoking. I still smoked after I got saved, but it finally gave me up. And drinking, and, and uh, you know, I uh, may have told this story before. There was a Jewish fellow in Chicago where I used to work, uh, the field building on the 27th floor, that big office building right downtown the Loop, and and uh, he, uh, his name was Sid, and and he always, uh, well, he felt sorry for me, and I said, well, why? He said, well, Wilmington, you're going to the Moody Bible Institute, and my goodness, he said, uh, you know, I heard about some of those rules. He said, you can't dance, you can't smoke, you can't drink. Uh, he said, I, I really feel sorry. You can't even go to show. He said, I, I feel sorry for you. Well, I knew that Sid had just been uh, engaged, uh, just gotten engaged to a very beautiful Jewish girl. He'd been moaning and groaning around the office for some time, wondering if this girl would ever marry him. And then uh, just a few days before that, uh, he said he was driving along and, and uh, in the loop or on Michigan uh, Boulevard there. And suddenly she said, I, I accept your offer. And well, he didn't even know he'd proposed so many times. He wasn't even sure what she was talking. He said, what do you mean? And she said, I accept your offer. I'll marry you. And Sid said, I nearly drove into Lake Michigan. I was so happy. And so he bought her a big ring while well, they were planning for the marriage. And I said, you know, Sid, uh, you say you feel sorry for me. I feel sorry for you. Oh, he said, man, why would you feel sorry for me? I said, well, you've gone and got yourself 
course, I was single in those days. And I said, you gone and got yourself engaged to this gal and you're going to get married? I said, well, you can't ever go out on a blind date again. You can't ever, uh, uh, you know, take somebody else uh, out. You're going to be stuck with her the rest of your life. And I feel sorry for you. Well, he became very indignant. Oh, man, he said, you're crazy. He said, it's not that I can't, Wilmington. It's I don't want to. I found somebody I love. And, well, I'm sure you uh, can uh, conclude what... Uh, why I told that story, and I said, hey, listen, uh, that's exactly my answer. It's not that I, I can't. I said, I don't want to. I found somebody that I love. So it's not asceticism, uh, but it's a, it's a turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he warns people, don't turn from unless you are prepared to turn to the living God. All right? And this is the danger uh, uh, the nature of some of these perversions. And now, what is the answer uh, to these perversions? And all seven of these you can still find in Bible-believing churches, let alone liberal churches today. So what's the answer? Well, we've suggested a fourfold answer here. Number one, know who Jesus is. All Christianity is not the application of certain principles. It is the acceptance of a person. The greatest thing about Christianity is directly related to the only thing about Christianity, and that is Jesus. You can no more have Christianity without Christ than you can have the sun without sunlight or meat without proteins. He must be a part, the center. The, there's no such thing as a, as a social gospel. There is only a Christ gospel. And in uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 3 and 9, Paul says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Oh, our Jehovah Witness friends, bless their hearts. Why, though, can they hold on to their hellish doctrine that Jesus Christ is not God, when Paul says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you think that God the Father and God the Son or God the Spirit would put themselves, as it were, into the body of an angel man? And that's really what the Jehovah Witnesses say, that an angel took upon himself the body of a man, and that angel was Jesus. No, that may be what Charles Taze Russell said, but that's not what the Apostle Paul declares here. All right, so we need to know, in order to escape these perversions, who Jesus is. Secondly, we need to know what he has done for you and for me. Colossians 2, verses 13 and 50. In you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, uh, we called your attention to verse 15 here, uh, that he has uh, uh, forgiven your trespasses, blotting out the handwritings of ordinances against us. Uh, to expand this theological blessing of the verse, I'd like you to consider a statement as we have in our notes here, found in Genesis 2.19, back to the Garden of Eden again. It says that Adam called every living creature the name thereof. Uh, Adam um, had a fantastic vocabulary. He certainly uh, knew all the words uh, that were ever penned, I suppose, or that were uh, the words that are known today, the Chinese words and and uh, Japanese and all the various dialects, I think, then came from Adam, and, and uh, men still have this knowledge uh, up to the Tower of Babel, and then, of course, uh, the mirror of language was broken, and each nation then picked up a little 
a shattered piece of glass from this beautiful mirror of, of uh, language. But at any rate, what a, what a vocabulary he had. Uh, but uh, I have a sermon entitled, When Adam Learned Some Cuss Words, because there were seven words that Adam did not know experientially or maybe even linguistically until five seconds after the fall. And these seven words are experienced by every, at least uh, known, uh, by every uh, teenager and every grade school child today. Uh, these words, though, that this brilliant uh, man did not know until he sinned experientially is the word death, nakedness, cursed, sorrow, thorns, sweat, and sword. You remember God told him that he would die and experience death in Genesis 3. And then uh, the scripture says that he knew he was naked. He didn't know what that was until that time. And then God says the ground is cursed for your sake and thorns will infest it. And uh, to the woman, uh, she would be bogged down with the sorrows of childbirth. And Adam, God told, would earn the bread that he earned by the sweat of his brow and then he was taken out of the garden of eden and a sword was placed in the hands of uh, an angel and keeping him from a uh, re-entrance to the uh, garden of eden now after the fall adam then of course added those bitter and bloody words to his vocabulary and the echo of these wicked words haunted adam and mankind for over 40 centuries. And then came along the second Adam. That's the name for Jesus. And the New Testament says basically that he came to undo what the first Adam had done. And what was that? He came to blot out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us. So uh, to uh, use a, a little uh, simile here, I hope it's not too crude for you, the second Adam... Uh, comes in with a uh, bucket of whitewash and he goes to the uh, to the men's room where filthy words have been inscribed upon the walls, vile, filthy words, and he begins to paint that vile uh, men's room uh, beautiful white and covers up those wicked, uh, sinful words. And he dealt with them one at a time, of course, the scripture says that he was stripped of his garments and he experienced nakedness. He was put on a cross and that speaks of uh, being cursed for us. And the scripture refers to him as a man of sorrows. He came wearing a crown of thorns. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And then he took that sword in his side when the soldier pierced him to find out if he was dead. And then he died and experienced uh, Hebrews 2, 9. He, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. So as a result of this, Paul can literally shout out the truths here in Colossians 2, 14, that these terrible words of condemnation have been forever blotted out. So what is the answer to the perversions that we've talked about? Know who Jesus is. Secondly, know what he has done for you. Thirdly, know who you are. You have to know who you are. Uh, who am I? I'll tell you who I am. I'm pretty important. Maybe not to you, but I'm important to God, and you're important to God, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith and the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And the fourth thing that we are to know in order to answer and to safeguard ourselves against these perversions, we are to know what we are to do for him. Know who Jesus is, know what he's done for me, know who I am, and then know what I'm to do for him. What am I to do for Jesus? Is there anything I can do it for him? Yes. Verse 7, chapter 2. And ye have therefore, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We are to walk God's walk and read God's word 
and then we are to abound with thanksgiving. Roman numeral three. Now, thus far we have looked at the deity and preeminence of the Savior, and then the danger and perversion of the serpent, and now the duty and performance of the saints. And he really expands this in chapters 3 and 4. By the way, I think during the last tape I said that Colossians had three chapters. It's been a long day, and when I made that tape, uh, I did know the difference. Uh, Ephesians has six chapters, and Colossians uh, actually, in my Bible, has uh, sort of two, two chapters. It has, it has four chapters, so I'm sorry about that mistake. Uh, but uh, chapters 3 and 4 give us the duty and performance of the saints in relation to the Son of God. He begins in chapter 3 by saying, uh, If ye, and literally it's the word since ye, in, the, in light of the matter that you have, been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Some people say, don't you think you can be so uh, heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? That's true, but for every one person that's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. There are some 99 Christians that are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. But we are to uh, seek those things that are above, because where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. So in relation to the Son of God, we're to do that. In relation to the Word of God, what are we to do? And how important is this verse? I told you some time ago, uh, I love John 3.16, I love 2 Timothy 3.16, and here's another important 3.16, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then in relation to the work of God, in chapter 3, verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or do, deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. And then relationship to our personal lives in chapter 3, verses 5 to 12, we're to two, do two things, to put off the works of the flesh and put on the works of God. In relation to our prayer life, in chapter 4, we are to continue in prayer for ourselves and for Paul. He said, Christian workers, that he would find an open door service. In relation to our public life, we are to walk in wisdom toward them that are without the world, redeeming the time. There are two important things that need to be redeemed. Our bodies, and Jesus takes care of that, and our time, and we are to take care of that. And then in relation to the home, uh, what is the duty and performance of the saints? He speaks about wives. We're to submit, you're to submit yourself to your husbands. Husbands, you're to love your wives. Children, you're to obey your parents. Fathers, we are not to provoke our children. And then in relation to the job, the servants or the workers are to obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. And then relationship, our relation to Christian lay people, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And then in relation to Christian leaders, and here you have nine names uh, that Paul closes this powerful epistle by listing these key Christian leaders associated in some manner with his ministry at that time. Now, this book, and I never really had preached my way through it until I made this special study, and, and it's uh, of recent uh, days become one of my favorites in the Word of God. And I hope these two lectures have been helpful to you. Thank you.